So um, I'm going to continue the conversation uh, showing some a little bit of science and a little bit of uh, case examples uh, off of what Dr. Selber just talked about. I, too, am a consultant for and receive research support from TEI Biosciences. Um, so Dr. Selber went into a lot about repair technique, and a lot of this conference is about repair technique, and I think that's of the utmost importance, and we can debate which techniques are better. Um, Dr. Selba also showed some of our, our recent data about initial mesh strength, and I think it's important to consider that because uh, the initial strength that the patient has when they valsalva, when they wake up, when they're moving, um, that has to be taken into consideration. And what we found with Surgimed is that it's not only incredibly strong, but it's actually stronger than most of the synthetic meshes out there. Um, those are both important qualities to consider when choosing how to fix the abdominal wall, but additionally important is to consider how the mesh incorporates over time. Now, personally, I hate the term incorporation because it's very ill-defined. Um, as a resident, I was told incorporation means you don't see the mesh anymore, um, but I don't know if that's true, if that's false. What does that mean? So the term I like to use is integration. How has the mesh integrated with the host tissue? And I define that as three different variables that have to be considered, adherence of the mesh, vascularization, and then remodeling and replacement. So this is uh, just one slide from uh, a rat animal model that I've developed using surgimen intraperitoneally. And we varied various conditions, such as uh, suture fixation, um, denuding of the, the mesothelial lining of the, of the peritoneal surface here, et cetera come back a month later and just look to see what changes. And what you can see is this beautiful vascularization, this vascular penumbra coming from the site of adherence from the suture. Um, and although there's initially just adherence by the suture, eventually you get collagen ingrowth from the host, making it more of a molecular adherence. And you get this great vascularization where you can honestly see that this device is becoming tissue, and you can see a transition point in that device where it becomes tissue, and we know from other time points, the further out we go, uh, the further this vascular penumbra goes out, really extending this device to, to tissue transition all the way out towards the periphery. What are the signals that allow that to happen? This really remains unsolved at this point. Um, one of the things we know about surgimen is that it's a fetal or neonatal, depending on the thickness, um, dermal matrix, and so there's a higher ratio of type 3 to type 1 collagen. This might have a signaling mechanism. There might be other things involved as well. So when I'm talking about abdominal wall reconstruction, obviously it's important to think about the repair technique, and through all the data that we've seen today, I try to avoid abridged repair if possible. But if a bridge repair is unavoidable, I would like to use the strongest, thickest material that will still integrate well over time. And I'll show you some examples using surgimen where that's the case. In cases of contamination, infection, the poor wound healers in general that we all see, um, I think some degradation of the collagen matrix is still okay if what you have left behind retains the majority of its strength and integration profile. In other words, if you're starting with something stronger and thicker, having it be a little bit less thick and a little bit weaker may still be okay if you're starting from a good point. So let me show you some examples. Uh, this is just going back to technique. Dr. Selber and I do things slightly differently. Um, I basically will use the mesh and I will cut my suture line. This is an earlier case of mine where I'm drawing out where I'm gonna place my sutures and it's about a centimeter from the edge. I know now from our uh, in vitro work, the mechanical strength testing work, that in a three to four millimeter thick piece of surgeon, it's very unlikely my suture will pull through the mesh. And so I will go as close to the edge as I need to. Um, I also know that based on other data, um, any amount of if your suture line is centimeters within and you have a lot of excess mesh over here, um, it may not be adherent to your abdominal wall and so it may not provide you any real strength. Um, this is just an example of a full thickness myofascial resection. I'll do my component separations. I tend to do an underlay and I will sew just lateral to the semi-luminaris line. One of the things I've found from some of my in vitro work is the question of when you have an intact mesothelial peritoneal lining against your biologic mesh, does that help, does it hurt? Um, I found some of my postoperative CT scans, and this was mentioned by one of the speakers earlier, that weeks out you still see seroma. And if you have seroma there, you're not getting good apposition of the mesh to the abdominal wall. So what I've started doing is I've actually scored 
the mesothelial lining in between uh, the abdominal wall and my mesh. And I based this, this is just to show that, I based this on some of my in vitro rat experiments where again, I'm having similar suture fixation at the four corners in this example where the mesothelial lining is left intact and this example where we've denuded it. Come back five weeks later and you can see that the only adherence of the surge mend where the mesothelial lining was left intact is at the side of the sutures. Whereas if I've denuded all this at the time of implantation, I've got a much more significant adherence at a molecular level. And so when we talk about the strength of your repair, I think techniques like this may make a difference. So here's my component separation, and I'll try to avoid a bridged repair with possible. You can see that I've got my uh, mesh sewn just lateral to the rectus complexes bilaterally, and I will place a drain in between the mesh and the rectus complex. I also do perforator sparing techniques when possible, like Dr. Silver pointed out, even one or two perforators per side, or even in general, is probably enough to avoid a lot of the complications to the soft tissue of the abdominal wall. So let me show you some case examples now that sort of span the gamut of my practice. Um, the elective ventral uh, hernia repair, this is sort of my bread and butter, um, a very large ventral hernia. This is a lady, uh, late 60s, uh, colon cancer, status post low anterior resection, metastatic to the liver, status post a partial hepatectomy, and you can see both those incisions. She also had metastasis to her lungs and had a thoracotomy. She's no evidence of disease, but living with this large hernia. Because these are all cancer patients, they all get pre- and post-operative CT imaging for surveillance. And we had a speaker earlier today asking if this was necessary. In my practice, I do find it's necessary. It helps me to plan the surgery, and it helps me to know if my repair is still intact over time. So this is just part of her uh, pre-operative CT. You can see she has herniation of her liver with a big bioloma. You can see she has herniation of the large and small bowel in a supraumbilical position. This is just showing the intraoperative photos where basically I've done a bilateral component separation, underlay, and full closure in the midline. Here she is two weeks post-op with a, an intact repair. And here she is at varying time points, 4, 10, 14, and 17 months post-op with no evidence clinically of a hernia recurrence or a bulge. Um, her belly is strong. She tells me she's engaged in all the physical activities she needs to be engaged in. We also have CT evidence, and I've chosen a couple of different uh, sections from each time point. The reason I show these is because I didn't particularly measure the mesh width very well when I did this case initially, and so when I closed the myofascium in the midline, I got this bulge or, or this little wrinkle right here, but that's okay um, because it helps me to follow something over time. And so what I like to see on these images is that I can see the presence of the, the device that I'm now going to call tissue, formerly known as surgiment. You can see it here. It's relatively brightly lit, which I'd like to think means it's well vascularized based on all the other in, uh, rat data and everything I have that suggests that it is. But you can still see it well past a year. And it's thinned. It's remodeled. But it's still giving integrity to the repair. And we know that clinically. This is another example after a, a uh, partial hepatectomy from a colon cancer, and he's been walking around with a very large lateral hernia for some time. Here's one image from his preoperative CT. So um, the rectus complex on the right side has been totally denervated, and it's, uh, there's, this is basically going to be a large bridge repair with possibly some thin fascia overlying it. Here he is one year post-op from that repair. Here he is 26 months post-op from that repair. And here he is four and a half years from that repair. So this was a piece of Surgiment 4.0, the thickest, strongest piece that we have in what was basically a bridged repair with some thin fascia overlying it. And clinically, he has no evidence of a hernia, no evidence of a bulge. Now, we asked uh, one of the speakers earlier, how do we define recurrence of hernia? Is it clinically? Is it radiographically? And I think all those need to potentially be taken into consideration. Clinically, I would say he has no recurrence of hernia. Radiographically, let's see what that looks like. So um, this is his initial hernia. Here he is at two months post-op. And again, you can see the four millimeter thick surgimen placed right there with still some inflammation in the sub-Q. That inflammation has considerably decreased well over a year out, but again, you can still see 
the tissue formerly known as Surgimend. Here he is at 20 months out. Here's the 20 months out again just for comparison. Here he is over two years out. You can still see the surgeon in there. And here he is at four and a half years out. Now, clearly it doesn't look quite the same. The surgeon has remodeled, but clinically he feels strong. He had no idea that he might have had a hernia. The liver surgeon who was gonna reoperate on this patient because he has recurrence of disease, didn't, he called me and said, I don't think he has a hernia. Do we need to do anything special? Um, here's his recurrence of disease, you can see right there. So we actually just did this case last week. Um, so we had to go through our old repair. It's very unusual I get a patient where I do have to go back into the belly, but I was happy to have the opportunity. Um, I'm just showing you sort of the cut edge that we went through in terms of getting access to the liver. And you can see some of my former uh, proline sutures here. I tend to use proline as opposed to an absorbable suture. And what I'm trying to show you here is the, the thick quality of the, um, of the myofascial abdominal wall where the four millimeter thick surgeon was placed four and a half years ago. There was no, um, the, the entirety of the sheet of surgimend was not really evidence, but there were some areas where I could still see and feel what to me looked like surgimend, so I biopsied those. And this just shows a quick uh, H&E histology from that, and I literally got these about two days ago. But this is basically the surgimend here, and you can see this is the patient's myofascial abdominal wall that it's well adherent to. When we go at a higher power, you can see down here, this is basically the matrix as it used to appear even before we put it in the patient. And this is showing excellent sort of integration at a molecular level. Um, there's no encapsulation, there's no foreign body response. It is basically adherent uh, to the patient's tissue and doing what we needed to do even four and a half years out. So strength matters. Um, this is an example of a patient that ha is about to undergo an external hemipelvectomy for recurrence of sarcoma and lymphedema. Um, this is just to show you the kind of bone pelvic cuts that are made. So a significant hemipelvectomy going all the way through. And this is the defect that we're left with. So this is all the intraperitoneal content that's gonna be herniating out through this pelvic defect. And although we can close up the soft tissue, um, we wanna to try to minimize this herniation becoming a problem going forward. So in planning a reconstruction, I'd like to choose something that's gonna be the thickest, strongest, most well integrating that I can. So again, this is an example where I'd use a four millimeter thick piece of surgiment. And this is just to show you how I put it in. in a, this is an external hemipelvectomy, meaning an amputation of the extremity. But I do far more internal hemipelvectomy reconstructions where the iliofemoral vessels have to be preserved and are coming through here. So I basically will sew this in three uh, dimensions. I'll sew it to the, the remaining ilium, to the myofascial abdominal wall, and to the pubis. But there's really nothing sturdy to sew it to posteriorly, especially when the vessels are still present. And so you want something that's thick and strong that when you sew it in tautly over the defect, it's going to act like a canopy, like a hammock, and really keep everything up there as best it can. Here she is four months post-op. Unfortunately, you can already see four months post-op, she's got recurrence of sarcoma. What about contaminated fields? And I'm going to use the example of the enterocutaneous fistulae. We've heard a lot today about um, how to attack these patients and how to potentially stage the repairs. I'm going to show you an example. This is a one-stage repair. So this is a gentleman that initially presented eight months prior for a radical cystoprostatectomy. Intraoperatively, it had to be converted to a pelvic exenteration. At that time, I was called in to perform a muscle flap reconstruction of the, of the pelvic dead space. Um, so I used his right rectus muscle only. He had had a previous umbilical hernia repair. It wasn't clear to me if he had synthetic mesh, no mesh, so I wasn't sure if I could use a myocutaneous flap. So I did muscle only, left all the fascia there, asked the urologist, hey, it's late at night, I wasn't planning to be here, can you close the belly? Sure, no problem. And then he got these enterocutaneous fistulae, so I feel responsible for that. Um, but th basically, we took about eight months to get these under control. These were high output fistulas, somewhere in the mid to distal um, ilium. And uh, he finally came back for repair. So the repair was going to be that all of this soft tissue was like concrete. So the soft tissue had to be resected. In addition to repair of the fistulae themselves, he has an ileal conduit here for urinary uh, purposes. He has a colostomy here, which although viable, has never been functional because all the output has come out proximally. 
And so I need to mobilize this soft tissue to get this soft tissue defect closed. In the meantime, we have to fix the abdominal wall and try to prevent herniation. So what we did is we took down the colostomy, left the ileal conduit in place. I took a piece of four millimeter thick 20 by 30 surgiment. I basically sewed it as a keyhole in, in, as an underlay in the peritoneum around the ileal conduit. And then I stretched it over towards the left side, measured out where I thought the colostomy should come through, and this is my midline marking there, cut a hole, brought the colostomy through, and then did a unilateral component separation on this side in order to get a non-bridged repair in the middle, and then closed this old site where the colostomy came through and brought it out at a slightly more lateral place, which would be in the appropriate position once we mobilized all the soft tissue. One stage repair. Here he is four months post-op. He had really no post-operative complications. He's doing extremely well. The repair feels secure. It feels strong. CT evidence, because these are cancer patients, here we go. So again, you can see the four millimeter thick surgimend as the underlay. You can see the rectus muscle here on the left side. Remember, there's no rectus muscle on the right side because we already used it for pelvic reconstruction. So again, I need something fairly strong because the myofascial abdominal wall is already weakened from loss of that muscle. Here you can see his colostomy and the ileal conduit, and you can see the surgimend on either side of both of those ostomies, preventing, we hope, parastomal hernia formation in the future. And just a few more lower cuts where, again, you can see the surgiment in all the different right areas. So one staged repair, which I think worked well. What about composite resection and reconstruction? So this is a, an older lady who had a, a sarcoma of the abdominal wall after many years prior radiation treatment for cervical cancer. This is her composite resection, so infra-umbilically, basically all of the soft tissue and myofascial abdominal wall. No component separation, in my opinion, will ever be enough for that, so I used a piece of four millimeter thick surgiment once again for this bridged repair. I sewed it to anything I could, which was to the myofascial abdominal wall as an underlay. I only probably went about two or three centimeters uh, superior to the cut edge because I didn't think it was necessary to go higher. Sewed it to the pelvic bones as needed. And then for soft tissue reconstruction, I basically harvested a pedicled anterolateral thigh flap, which we then tunneled under a skin paddle there, under a skin bridge. And here she is about six weeks post-op, healing well, no immediate hernia or bulge. The repair, again, feels strong. As we know, the four millimeter thick surgeon is incredibly strong. We also know that it integrates well based on all other studies. Here she is four months post-op, and again, she's healing well, she looks good. Um, on this, from this angle, it looks like she has a hernia recurrence or a bulge, but I know from CT evidence it's not. It's unfortunately recurrence of her tumor. But what I do see is that here's the four millimeter thick surgiment as my bridged bilateral repair, and it's measured out to size, it's anchored well, and it's not causing any bulge, it's not causing any hernia, at least in the four month follow-up, and unfortunately she does have all this tumor recurrence. What about some other poor healers, just to go quickly through these? We see evisceration every so often. This is uh, one case example. This is a second case example. I unfortunately don't have the preoperative photos, but she's a mid-70s lady that three weeks prior had had a THBSO and now presented with evisceration and um, purulent fluid in the pelvis. So I was called in at that point to do something. I was told she was a sick lady, many morbidities, and we wanted to minimize return to the operating room if possible. So I knew the quality of her tissue was poor. A component separation was not really gonna work to get her closed in the midline at this time. And so what we did is we just took a thick piece of surge amend, 20 by 30, and almost used it as a bag, sewing it to the edges of the myofascial abdominal wall, something I could then vac over. And this is two days after that surgery, and you can already see that there's some granulation tissue starting. We basically vac her at the bedside with the hopes that we just eventually let it heal in secondarily. She actually did okay for a while, so we took her back to the operating room and just tried to get her closed. Now, one of the things, because the surgeon end is four millimeters thick, and I know how strong it is, I can put a suture partway through, two millimeters into it, and it's pretty much not gonna pull out. So I did this with some PDS suture, imbricated it, and just tried to get it closed in the midline as a way to bring her myofascial wall a little bit closer together, got her skin closed on top of that. 
Well, her skin didn't heal quite well on top of it, so we had to do some additional wound care and dressing changes, um, but ultimately she actually did well. So here you can see the surgeon that I placed sort of acting as our bridge repair in this open, contaminated setting. Here she is when I took her back just one more time. I kind of imbricated again, got it closed, and eventually she healed well. And this is just showing her, her stable wound. Now she can go on to get her chemotherapy. She can go on to get other therapies as she needs. This is seven months out. A couple last cases just showing gross infection. There's a gentleman who has Castleman's disease, so he's got um, a lymphoma that requires anti-IL-6 uh, therapy, so he's chronically immunosuppressed to avoid the lymphoma coming back. At some point, he got a necrotic gallbladder, required an open cholecystectomy, and now he has a hernia that he'd like fixed. So this is his pre-op scan, and you can see he's got denervation of the rectus complex on the side of the open cholecystectomy. Um, this is a little overexposed well, but um, we've talked about lateral hernias earlier today and how it's probably helpful to secure it to the paraspinous musculature and the linea alba and you know, try to get as many points of fixation as possible. I really didn't do that with this case because I was stupid. Um, but either way, I, uh, I did an underlay. I got the, the fascia closed on top of it. And one of the things I did not do with this case also was I did not put a drain between the mesh and the, uh, and the fascia, which in hindsight I would have liked to have. So this is him two weeks out. He actually looked like he was healing well. Here he is two weeks after that, four weeks out. And you can see the erythema. You can see the swelling. And from these former drain sites, you can see purulent material coming out. He wasn't sick, and I said, standard of care is to go back to the operating room to debride this, but if we do that, your hernia is back, and I don't have a good way to ever fix it again. So we got a CT scan just to see how bad the situation was, and this is his CT scan. So you can see the surgeon I placed about four weeks prior bathed in what turned out to be MRSA. So it's bathed on both sides with pus, but he wasn't that sick. And so we decided to take him to interventional radiology, had a drain placed. We had one placed superficially, one placed um, beneath the mesh intraperitoneally, and we kept him on antibiotics, and he actually did quite well. So here he is healing from that infection, and here he is six months post-infection, seven months post-initial surgery. He's gained some weight, but he's got no evidence clinically of a hernia recurrence. He gets uh, routine CT scans, and here's what I saw. So I will argue that this does not look like the normal surgeon that I put there, but I think one of the important things is when you start with something that's four millimeters thick, it integrates quickly vascularization-wise and adherence-wise with the abdominal wall host tissue. I think it's able to withstand a lot more insult, including being bathed in MRSA infection. So even though it doesn't look normal, it's still enacting its function never requiring debridement, and the patient's doing well. That's six months post-infection. Here he is 12 months post-infection, 13 months post-surgery, and he's doing well. He's probably more than about two years out now, and he hasn't called to say that he needs it refixed. One last infection. This is a gentleman with uh, metastatic colorectal cancer with peritoneal carcinomatosis, and he's going to get a HIPEC procedure, a heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy procedure con uh, with debulking, and he's obviously got this pre-op hernia that they'd like me to fix at the same time. So, exactly. Um, so here's his pre-op hernia, which you can see with considerable diastasis. Now, he did well after surgery. I did my standard repair of an underlay, bilateral component separation, et cetera, and he came back about five weeks post-op, not feeling well. We got a CT, and here's what we saw. Very superiorly, my rectus complex was still together with my surgeon end as an underlay. And if we go just a little bit more inferior, my rectus complex has pulled apart. Here's my surgeon end acting as a bridged repair. And in the subcutaneous space, I've got pus, and a lot of it. Um, so we took him back to the OR later that day. Here's what he looked like on the table. Um, obviously an obese gentleman, no evidence of any erythema or other signs of infection here, but this was almost two liters of the most foul, feculent smelling pus you could imagine, and it was bathed, uh, it was bathing the surgeon here where the rectus complex had dehissed just superior to the umbilicus. So what we did is we, we washed him out, we pulse lavaged him with, I used bacitrace and polymix and antibiotic irrigation. We curetted the, the bejesus out of it. And um, the one thing that I think was really important for me to see is that 
there was no seepage of the uh, purulence into the peritoneal space. So the surgeon, even though the muscles had dehissed here, the surgeon was well adherent to the undersurface of the rectus complex all the way around. So it was acting as a barrier. Even though it was bathed in this pus, it was still doing okay. We put a vac sponge in the entirety of the subcutaneous space, came back two days later for another washout. Here he is two days later. We eventually got the vac sponge smaller and smaller and you can see it's starting to granulate and sent him home. This is two weeks after that. And here he is two weeks later. So four weeks after the infection, we took him back to the operating room. With all the vac changes, he had this little bit of a rind on the, uh, the outer surface there of what was formerly surgimend. The surgimend I put in initially was four millimeters thick. This rind was about one millimeter thick. So it was about a three millimeter granulated piece of tissue formerly known as surgimen that was just deep to it, I was able to basically um, mobilize some tissue, get things closed, and get him closed on top of it. And so here he is six months out from that infection, so about seven or so months out from the initial surgery. And you can see that basically I can see the surgimen in various places. He's got a bit of a bridged repair here, but it feels strong. And I think that's one of the most important things for me to take home from this is that because the surgeon is so strong to begin with, even a bridged repair may still do very well for these very complicated patients. Clinically, six months out, he looks good. He feels strong. Nine months out, 13 months out, he's had this non-healing wound about his umbilicus that we've been dealing with. Um, for some period of time. Here's a CT scan 13 months out, looks pretty similar to the one previous. And here's a CT scan from just a week or so ago, 17 months out, and his repair still looks good, but we also know why he had this non-healing wound by his umbilicus, and he's got recurrence of disease about his umbilicus, he's got recurrence of disease elsewhere. And I think one of the most important reasons for me to consider a biologic mesh is because when we have to go back into these patients, when they get more chemotherapy, et cetera, um, it just puts them at increased risk for complications. Having a biologic mesh to me is much safer. So just to summarize, I think uh, Dr. Selber and I have shown that surgimen can safely and effectively be used in abdominal wall reconstructions. And there's increasing evidence that the repairs can both be long-term and with low hernia recurrence rates. I think to date, we've had very poorly defined variables that contribute to incorporation, or what I'd like to say is integration, of the bioprosthetic mesh with the host tissue, which requires a lot more investigation. I'd just like to make a plug for my poster with Kevin Cornwell. Um, we can have more conversations about some of these variables and how to think about them. And I do believe that materials choice may have varied outcomes, particularly in these poor healers in these infected fields. Thank you very much. All right, if there are no questions. We'll be around, come find us afterwards. Thank you again.